Pode, pode começar, viu, querida? Avisa aí o pessoal que vai começar. Você já está yeah, gravando? Uh, ok. Não, eu estava só esperando a, é, estar online. Uh, everyone, uh, I have a, a pleasure, the pleasure to open this last session uh, of the 21st meeting of On Pragmatism. International on Pragmatism. É, boa tarde a todos. Eu tenho a honra de abrir esta última sessão do 21º Encontro sobre Pragmatismo. Now we are going to listen to Professor Robert Innes, the author of uh, Dimensions of Aesthetic Encounters, Perception, Interpretation and the Science of Art. É, agora nós vamos ter o prazer de escutar o, o professor Ines, é, autor do livro Dimensões dos Encontros Estéticos, Percepção Inter... e os Signos. É, depois, é, ouviremos o comentário do professor Arthur Araújo. After, we are going to listen to the commentaries of uh, professor Arthur Araújo. So, uh, welcome everyone. And now I pass the floor to Professor Robert Innes, please. Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you here again and to listen to your wonderful book, about your uh, wonderful book. D'Artagnan, pode, acho que pode compartilhar. Obrigado. You can see on the screen a, a image that I sent last night of the uh, cover of the book, uh, which uh, uh, I was asked by the designer to uh, give him some ideas. And I thought it would be best to talk about uh, a widening gyre or a widening spiral of different illuminations and uh, the different dimensions of width and depth and whatever. And this is what he came up with. And in a certain sense, presents the very inner part of the, the trajectory of the, of, of the book. It's a spiral. And uh, as I will explain uh, in the course of my, of my lecture. So we can start now with uh, the first section. Uh, uh, as you can see, the title of the, of the talk is Dimensions of Aesthetic Encounters, but the subtitle is A Trail of Linkages. And this is how the book is constructed as a trail of linkages between philosophical analysis and exemplifications of what is being talked about in the book. So the book is filled with uh, very many examples from art, including 12 uh, illustrations from painting uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, anybody who ultimately sees the book will be able to uh, understand. So starting in 1977, I have followed a trail, uh, I've followed in a series of articles and books, a trail of conceptual and historical linkages between complementary approaches to the dimensions of aesthetic encounters and the nature and features of the objects and situations eliciting and informing them. By their material configurations and felt import, such objects and situations by no means restricted to the realm of art, elicit from us special forms of attention They draw us in or turn us away, all the while holding us in their grasp. These dimensions are explored and exemplified in the present book, focusing on the variety of conceptual tools that link a broad and open pragmatism and equally broad and open semiotics and a wide range of philosophical and other resources and examples. The book can or should itself be seen as offering a sequence of seven chapters that are themselves encounters, oscillating between analysis and exemplification. The chapters are based on and fuse a pre previously published essays and are not meant to be a treatise, but a trail of linkages. They are not mainly expository, but rather dialectical, exploratory, and argumentatively suggestive. Indeed, each chapter, especially the first two, leads to or is linked in different ways to other chapters with the broadening spiral of context to incorporate new viewpoints, correlations, and implications. You can see here chapter one, which is 
uh, after which the book is takes its name, Dimensions of an Aesthetic Encounter, is an analysis uh, of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, uh, of an aesthetic experience from a novel by uh, um, Iris Murdoch. But I'm not going to talk about that now. I want to just pass through so you can see how, it, how the, uh, the layout of the book works. Chapter one, Dimensions of an Aesthetic Encounter, <clears throat> Encountering Giorgione's Sunset. This allows one to emphasize the issues of the qualitative matrix, the notion of the play of interpretance, Gadamer's hermeneutical distinctions uh, between mimesis, poesis, and, semi and semiosis, plus other emphasis of other passages dealing with Proust, uh, the phenomenology of perception, uh, and Michael Dufresne's book on the phenomenology of the aesthetic experience, et cetera. The second chapter, called energies of objects begins a process of contrasting uh, uh, poles of uh, analytical uh, frameworks. But it also is based upon an example. Uh, this time, uh, the, uh, the uh, novelist and, and essayist, uh, uh, Siri Hustritz, uh, 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 encounter with The Tempest, which has itself, uh, of Giorgione's Tempest, which itself has a history of its own, and it allows one to bring up new issues concerning rhythms, uh, livingness, experiential forces, and the difference between description and prescription in aesthetic theory. The third chapter, dealing with quality and the theory of signs, has the controversial title, Dewey's Percy and Aesthetics. Uh, and it focuses upon the centrality of the theory of quality, uh, Dewey's notion of what it means for thought to go out into symbol symbolization, uh, and uh, the key notion uh, that Dewey it shows that he understood Purser's categories, his analysis of the difference between imagination, uh, the imaginary or the imaginal, the diagrammatical and the metaphorical dimensions of artworks. Uh, it also deals with the Dewey's notion of, of, of or correlates to uh, the, the Persian uh, notion of, a, of an interpretant. There is a further exemplification uh, uh, concerning Michelangelo's Moses, uh, where uh, the role of these interpretants and the nature of those interpretants and the differences in the interpretants uh, is brought to uh, the fore and given a very close discussion. Chapter four uh, takes us in a different direction. Uh, it started with a historical notion, and then uh, it's, it, it expanded out into something else. It, it turns out that uh, Dewey uh, and Samuel Alexander uh, uh, had great interconnections in, the, in aesthetics. And this chapter deals with uh, Dewey's uh, footnote and artist experience that led me to, uh, to uh, follow up the trail between Dewey and Samuel Alexander, which started with a simple, a simple footnote and a simple letter. But both of them allow us to deal with the whole issue of the materiality of inspiration and the intrinsic role of the medium uh, and the open nature of experiencing and also the uh, metaphysical links between Dewey's aesthetics uh, and uh, metaphysics and likewise with Samuel Alexander's. The fifth chapter, uh, called nat Between Nature and Art uh, was, uh, uh, is an examination of some key uh, examples from Dewey's aesthetics, the, the examples that he himself uses, uh, and uh, his uh, oscillation between his love of nature and his attempt to show that uh, the aesthetic grows out of the normal courses of experience. Uh, with uh, his uh, 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 his references to a number of other artworks, specifically to artworks from uh, the Chinese tradition, which he was very much uh, concerned with. It also deals with something that I talked about at this meeting several years ago on Dewey's approach to architecture and on the connection between uh, design and the hand and on the materiality of architecture and the uh, uh, shaping of space-time, both in art and life. The sixth chapter deals with another issue. It was a, it was a problem raised by uh, 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 Benami Scharfstein's book on art uh, uh, beyond borders, uh, which uh, raises uh, the question of how far 
that you can take uh, how provincial or not provincial is Dewey's uh, uh, aesthetics. It turns out he's completely open to uh, uh, aesthetic traditions uh, and art forms uh, that uh, did not come necessarily from the Western tradition or that were in any way pedestrian. Uh, and it also raises the issue of Persian parallels in the Taoist Dao vision of beauty. Uh, I gave a, uh, 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 for Evo's best trip, I dealt with that particular issue too. And that those materials are all put into this seventh, sixth chapter. The seventh chapter is feel, called Filling the Hole in Sense Between Art and Philosophy. And uh, this chapter basically pulls everything together, saying what is the whole point of this whole operation? And uh, what can philosophy learn from art? Not what can art learn from philosophy, but what can philosophy learn from art and not just visual art or, or verbal art, but also uh, it's been in a very real sense, the notion of music. What I'm going to do now is bring materials forward from the first two chapters called the beginning of the trail. And from now on, I will be uh, basically reading and not uh, just uh, uh, talking uh, ad hoc. The first two chapters are centered around the analytical implications of two aesthetic encounters, one fictional and one personal. First of all, a riveting passage from Iris Murdoch's novel, The Sacred and Profane Love Machine, presenting a fictional aesthetic encounter. And secondly, the novelist and essayist Siri Hustvedt's in the mysteries of the rectangle of her own prolonged and repeated encounters with a different painting by Giorgione, The Tempest. These two examples can illustrate central concerns bearing on aesthetic encounters that recur in different contexts throughout the book. The passage in Murdoch's novel describes the character Herrick Gavinder's encounter with Giorgione's famous painting, The Sunset, appropriately misnamed by, by Burrock for fictional purposes although not arbitrarily, St. Anthony and St. George. Murdoch constructs in rich, evocative language a complex image of Harriet's multi-leveled aesthetic encounter with a visual artwork during a late afternoon visit to the National Gallery in London. You can see the, uh, the, what is being described in the novel is not being reproduced, but I've, I've given it to you here so that you can see how it works. Here is the text from Murdoch. This is the text from the novel. She had felt very strange that afternoon. An intense feeling of anxiety had taken possession of her as she was looking at Giorgione's picture. There was a tree in the middle background, which she had never properly attended to before. Of course, she had seen it, since she had so often looked at the picture, but she had never before felt its significance, though what that significance was, she could not say. There it was in the middle of clarity, in the middle of bright darkness, in the middle of limpid, sultry, yellow air, in the middle of nowhere at all, with distant, when the two saints happened, how odd, to be doing their respective things, ignoring each other in a sort of murky yet brilliant glade, what on earth, however, was going on in the foreground, beside a delicious glistening pool out of which two small and somehow domesticated demons were cautiously emerging for the benefit of St. Anthony, while behind them St. George, with a helmet like a pearl, was bullying an equally domesticated and inoffensive little dragon. Hypnotized by the tree, Harriet found that she could not take herself away, she stood there for a long time, staring at it, tried to move, took several paces, looking back over her shoulder, then came back again, as if there were some vital message which the picture was trying and failing to give her. Perhaps it was just Giorgione's maddening genius for saying something absurdly precise, and yet saying it so marvelously that the precision was all soaked away into a sort of cake of sheer beauty. This nervous mania of anxious looking back, Harriet recalled having suffered when young in the Louvre and the Uffizi and the Academia. The last visit on the last day, as closing time approached, indeed the last minutes of any day, 
had had this quality of heartbreaking severance combined with an anxious, thrilling sense of a garbled, unintelligible, urgent message. This is a remarkable description uh, with exemplifying force and analytical power of a full and deep encounter with the classic painting. For Harriet, the encounter with the painting, what Dewey called the art product on the way to becoming the artwork, is first and foremost a work of embodied perception, just as the actual production of the painting was. Its enigmatic significance, however, elicits a work of interpretation, just as the painting itself is a materially constructed interpretation or presentation of a complex spiritual relationship conveying a vital message. But in spite of its explicitness, indeed its absurd precision, what it means seems to slip away beyond the bounds of discourse, even though the configuration of marks on the canvas was as articulate as possible and consummately beautiful and ordered. Herod is shown to find a deep affective affinity, not necessarily harmonious, between herself and the world and its objects presented in the painting. The affective quality or affective tone that structures the painting offers her a source both of self-recognition as well as a kind of shattered, even undefined and undefinable self-completion. The painting speaks to her, even though she is not able to say or fully comprehend what it is saying. Murdoch, at the analytical level, pinpoints distinctive features of the existential meeting between Harriet and the painting. Both the literary description and the painting described which are mutually or which are clearly correlative and mutually defining are perceptually thick and hermeneutically engaging and, engage and nuanced. They exemplify the diversity and complexity of signifying powers of the various material elements which carry the perceptual qualities and objects and significances embodied in, embodied in represented by and expressed in the painting at least as fictionally constituted. Reading this passage with philosophical eyes, one sees the triad of feeling, reaction, and thought, and the complex nature of the total resultant quality of feeling that Peirce assigns to the complex interpretant of a work of art. One also sees a thick description of the perceptual course of the experience and its funded affective force structures, which Dewey was so concerned with in art as experience. Moreover, what type of paradoxical semiotic phenomenon is this garbled, unintelligible, urgent message that is at the same time absurdly precise? How did so, does it so attract and move Harriet, pulling her toward it both in memory and in the present encounter? What type of energy does it have to affect her and draw her toward it? Harriet clearly feels herself put into play by this painting, which is both unsettling and consoling. These issues, as well as many others, are raised and foregrounded in chapter one and are taken up further in different analytical contexts in the following chapters, where Peirce's schema of interpretants and iconic signs, Dewey's analysis of art as an authentic form of thinking in, not about qualities, and a going out into symbolization beyond the propositional and Langer's indispensable notion of presentational abstraction as opposed to discursive abstraction are brought together. Of course, Murdoch's fictional description of someone else's experience written by a philosopher novelist deeply familiar with aesthetics is eminently artful in its analytical subtlety and slyness. This is not the case with Siri Hustwitz's description of her own encounter with the Tempest. Can we go back to the image so that everybody can see? Okay. Unlike Murdoch's, we can go back to the text now. Unlike Murdoch's cameo text, which appears in the course of a fictional narrative, uh, Husved's essay, as well as the others in her book, is marked by a recurring use of analytical elements and pointers to engagement with painting, which she sketches in the introduction to her book. Here's the types of things she says. Painting, Husved argues, are marked by an immutable stillness. They're, 
Their presence as a wordless image with an all there now quality that defines what's inside its edges and in Dewey's formulation, thereby rendered intense. This that foregrounds the necessity of long viewing periods and periods of rest, flights and perchings in order for the image to settle in the mind and come to endure in memory as a kind of capital that funds later viewings. She points out, however, that while expectation prevents discovery, no person leaves himself behind in order to look at a painting, or we might say to read a text or listen to a piece of music or whatever it would be. At the same time, she provocatively claims there can be found remarkable unity of response to paintings from seemingly different receptive sensibilities. Of course, such unity does not mean identity. The fundedness both enables and restricts our access to what Murdoch called the painting or artwork's vital message. It is part of what Dewey called the total organic response and Persis' contention that each person has their own particular character and purses and uh, and that and, and that enters into all they do. It is not purse rights in the head alone, but pervades the whole person, a felt unity or disunity of the affective, actional, and thought fields embodied in habits that make up a person's life and that make up their four structures of existence. For who's felt this message is accessed through the feeling it gave me. Such a feeling is rooted in and configures the somatic and affective tone of the perceiver, as Murdoch also indicated. Husfeld writes, visceral responses to an image are inevitably avenues to meaning. Although one cannot always name or be clear about the reasons for a picture affecting us in a certain way, this lack of clarity in the felt responses introduce, induces mental peregrination into the unknown waiting for a while to see what happens, a perceptual process that is an adventure in an imaginary space, but no arbitrary musing. It is a form of bound musing, defined by the marks left by a person's physical gestures, strokes, dabs, and smudges, and by extension, any medium in which an expressive form is created or realized, a central point made by Dewey and Samuel Alexander on the materiality of the medium that is foregrounded in chapter four and confirmed by James Elkins and Nigel Wentworth on the dialogue between paint and the evoked and guided gesture of its application, a topic introduced in the chapter one and taken up in later ones. These theoretical observations play a role in Husfeldt's essay, The Pleasures of the Wilderness, which was written 26 years after her first encounter with the Tempest in a college art history course. How does she describe the lived quality of her first encounter? It is, she writes, a physical response, a genuine tremor of amazement. She fell in love with it, an almost electrical connection to the painting. The image seemed to burn itself into my memory with an almost disturbing clarity, she writes creating for her a transcendent moment. The clarity, however, is paradoxically confounding. It is animated, radiates something. The smallness of image forces closeness of vision, attention to detail and underlying relations. It resists, constrains, and lures the bluer's, viewer's searching gaze. Yet, she says, nobody knows what the painting is about. A painting without a subject Three visits to the academia are characterized as repetitions of the first rapture undergone in the college course. But we have here the indexical role of a man figure pointing to a woman, she says, in a game of glances in an imaginary space. The nudity of the woman, she says, signifies timeless, timelessness in that enchanted landscape. The face of the woman is illuminated by a light from a mysterious source the mysterious otherness of the nude woman, the lack of codes, although we need some known codes and, and precedents, albeit consciously, unconsciously operating. Her coming back to something like the Tempest is due to the quality of cryptic, of cryptic excess, as if an inanimate thing were endowed with an elusive, almost sacred power. 
Busfeld sees this painting as an exemplification of the enigma of seeing. The tempest, she remarks, will always resist my understanding and demand constant return, willed and unwilled, with a concomitant physical response. Go to, if we go to the next, I'd like to have two, two glosses on this, one taken from Langer and one taken from Dewey and one taken from Langer that bear upon this and which are discussed in great detail in chapter two of the book. Dewey and Langer offer tools for what I call analytical glosses on these texts. In Dewey's art as experience, we find the following text on the nature of this pull. He says, we say with truth that a painting strikes us. <coughs> there is an impact that precedes all definite recognition of what it is about. As the painter Delacroix said about this first and pre-analytic phase, before knowing what the picture represents, you are seized by its magical accord. This effect is particularly conspicuous for most persons in music. The impression directly made by an harmonious ensemble in any art is often described as the musical quality of that art. Is this not an essential experiential aspect of what Peirce meant by the immediate interpretant, which is then articulated in phases and ultimately synthesized into the total resultant quality which is then articulated uh, and uh, that marks the proper significant effect of an artwork, a landscape or atmospheric event or phenomenon of nature. The language of striking, of impact being seized, directly made impression, bears also upon the energetic or interruptive aspect of an aesthetic encounter and the experienced array of charged objects and their relational configurations that ground their felt meaning, the Persian total result and effect of an aesthetic encounter. Dewey's passage here bears, bears comparison with the rich passage from the first volume of Susan Langer's Mind Trilogy that bears upon the underlying elements that give rise to and support the experiences imagined by Murdoch and recounted by Hustvedt. The artist's eye sees in nature, and even in human nature betraying itself in action, an inexhaustible wealth of tensions, rhythms, continuities, and contrast that can be rendered in line and color. And those are the internal forms, which the external forms, paintings, musical or poetic compositions, or any other works of art express for us. Art makes form expressive for us wherever we are confronted in actuality, as well as in art. Natural forms become articulate and seem like projections of the inner forms of feeling. Art is the objectification of feeling and the subjectification of nature. Indeed, the sphere of art for Langer is to be found where diverse means and very subtle ways of projecting ideas force themselves on one's attention, force themselves. This is connected with Dewey and Langer's notion of the vital quality of livingness or organic realization in the sense of an artworks having a career or being arrived at. Langer also points out that livingness is presented by a pattern of tensions felt in the body. This pattern, she writes, reflects feeling predominantly as subjective originating within us like the felt activity of muscles and the stirring of emotions. Precisely a characterization of Dewey's live creature in art as experience and in Murdoch's and Hustvedt's text. These two examples with their subtle foregrounding of the experiential and semiotic dimensions of aesthetic encounters appear in the first two chapters of the book. And they were put there deliberately to illustrate or exemplify one fictionally and the other literally, the types of issues and categories a philosophical reflection on the dimensions of aesthetic encounters leads to and are explored by the enriching conceptual complementarity of the aesthetic frameworks of Gadamer, Peirce, Dewey, Langer, James, and others. In the following chapters, further systematic programmatic and historical aspects of these dimensions are taken up, as I showed at the beginning. But in this chapter two, the chapter that concerned with Hustvedt, 
There were many other paintings that are talked about, two in particular, uh, Renoir's Bathers in the Forest and Hans Hoffmann's The Golden Wall. Uh, and they are uh, shown to, to, to be connected completely uh, 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 in, a, in an unforced way uh, uh, with this, although it's pretty obvious that Bathers in the Forest and Hans Hoffmann's abstract, The Golden Wall, uh, have very different types of energies, but they do have uh, uh, energies that still have deep resemblances to one another. In chapter three, unfortunately, I have In chapter, in chapter three, Dewey's aesthetic theory uh, with the central role of, of, of a category of quality and an implicit semiotic schema is proposed as essentially Persian, whereas fundamentally compatible with, even completing on the, from the air experiential side of Persian aesthetics. And in this uh, chapter there, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the illust main illustration is an illustration uh, from taken from uh, Michelangelo's Moses and four different approaches to interpreting it uh, from Robert Browning uh, to John Dewey to Freud and to Vasari. And uh, this simply deepens the, uh, the very notion of, an, of, an, of interpretants looked at through Dewey's, through Dewey's eyes. On the other hand, uh, in chapter in chapter four, as I said, uh, we have central features and implications of the nature and extent of the material medium in both aesthetic production and reception, and the consequent inadequacy of the notion of a free cosmic creation ex nihilo as model for artistic creation and by extension interpretation. They are shown uh, to be totally inadequate to think of cosmic creation ex nihilo or the artist uh, or the writer or whatever presents something simply uh, uh, floating out of their heads. These are, uh, just, we are the, the production and, recept and, re and uh, reception are, are funded, they are, they are bound. In chapter five, which deals with Dewey's and Dewey's artist experience, uh, he explore. Uh, he he gives. Uh, uh, it is an exam. Uh, in chapter five, I give a long set of uh, of analyses of Dewey's examples of uh, from his uh, love of nature. Uh, examples from Emerson on nature and from W. H. Hudson on nature. Uh, he has a, a, a long discussions of Van Eyck's The Arnolfini of Marriage, uh, uh, the Mona Lisa. Uh, and other landscape paintings from, uh, from uh, Chinese art. Uh, the, there is no time to deal with those at this, in, in this particular talk, but uh, these are a, a further way of following the dual track in the, uh, in the book uh, of, 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 uh, of analysis as one, as one track and exemplifications on the other. They're like two blades of a scissors, and the whole job is to uh, bring those two blades together to cut into uh, the uh, uh, the example. Uh, chapter six, once again, as I said, is concerned with uh, 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 the notion of a cosmopolitan aesthetics of a theory beyond borders, such as Benamese Sharpstein had talked about. But what is more significant is uh, the uh, presence or, or the power of Dewey's and Peirce's analysis to deal with uh, the paradigmatic primacy of representation and the challenge to it uh, by uh, Francois Julien's book on the great image has no form, which tries to show uh, that the object relatedness of most of, my, of most Western painting uh, is uh, is uh, totally repudiated uh, by the uh, by Chinese painting. That Chinese painting is basically concerned with uh, the non-object. Uh, the openness out of which objects emerge and disappear. Uh, and for, furthermore, that there are no distinct lines and nature that would ultimately uh, separate things in any uh, total way. Chapter seven is the most important chapter from one point of view in the book because it tries to draw the lessons of, of, uh, of, of that art has to teach philosophy. 
So chap the concluding chapter takes up the physician philosopher uh, Raymond Tallis's claim that aesthetic experience and its mediation through artworks can be seen as a way of healing a permanent wound in consciousness, which he sees as inflicted by discursivity and the drive toward explanation and argumentation that makes it difficult for us to be present to our experience on the far side of use. Talis's claim is linked with Vladimir Yankalevich's proposal in his book, Music and the, and the Ineffable, that music illustrated, for example, in the work of French modernism, by reason of its non-argumentative and non-totalizing nature, can function as a model for, for, for the, or at least for a, non-argumentative dimension of philosophy in pursuit of its and its pursuit and articulation of the variety of finite provinces of meaning that make up our lives. Artworks and non-totalizing forms of philosophical writing can nevertheless bear upon or evoke by their very finiteness the infinite or plenum of sense without claiming to encompass it. On this way of thinking, the fascinating multiplicity of artworks could be considered as non-reductive models that challenge philosophy to take on new episodic, epiphanic, or aphoristic forms. In doing so, they would enable us to maintain and restore our existential and experiential balance by mediating our being present to our many occasions of experience, including reflective experiences within what Dewey called an experience in nature, the moving, unbalanced balance of things. Both nature and art itself and its continuous upsurge of forms present to us objects, as Dewey put it, to the construction and perception of which the self has surrendered itself and devotion. And Langer writes, life is incoherent unless we give it form. By practices of creative and constructive attending, we participate in the formative processes and energies of nature itself. What the poet Paul Celan said about poems applies to all art and to nature itself in its boundless creativity and ordered energies. They are, he says, gifts, gifts to the attentive, to those ready to receive. Celan writes clearly with general import, the attentiveness a poem devotes to all it encounters with its sharper sense of detail, outline, structure, color, but also of quiverings and intimation is a concentration that stays mindful. Jean Daïf in Under the Dome, Walks with Paul, Paul Salon, characterizes Salon's approach to poetry as giving structure to an illegible world by a vibration of sense used as energy. For Salon, citing a remark by Nicholas Malebranche encountered in Walter Benjamin's Reflections on Kafka, Attending to these gifts and all their forms that poetry offers is the natural prayer of the soul. And Simone Weil, in a letter to a friend, Joey Bousquet, called attention the rarest and purest form of generosity, which he elsewhere described as an attentive openness, ready in it to receive in its naked truth the object which is to penetrate it. Such is the existential challenge and model that aesthetic, that aesthetic encounters present to us. Finally, in the section here, I go to number two of the, of the supplementary texts. Good. Moreover, uh, I do not think it can be denied that an element of reverie, of approach to a state of dream, enters into the creation of a work of art. This is a passage from Dewey. Uh, that enters into the creation of a work of art, nor that the experience of the work when it is intense often throws one into a similar state. Indeed, it is safe to say that creative conceptions in philosophy and science come only to persons who are relaxed to the point of reverie. The subconscious fund of meanings stored in our attitudes have no chance of release when we are practically or intellectually strained for much the greater part of this store is then restrained because the demands of a particular problem and particular purpose inhibit, inhibit all except the elements directly relevant. 
Images and ideas come to us not by set purposes, but in flashes. And flashes are intense and illuminating. They set us on fire only when we are free from special preoccupations. And it seems to me, this is what aesthetic experience and aesthetic encounters do. They both immerse us in the immediate, but they mediate more than merely being immersed in the immediate. They themselves belong to the world of mediations and the aesthetic perceptions that we uh, uh, encounter and develop further uh, are basically uh, uh, what has informed my own uh, approach to this book, uh, writing which was not so much a, uh, a labor uh, uh, of the, in the sense of pure work, but uh, more a, a labor of following up one's own inclinations and following the lines of, of, uh, of, of, of these hints, the trail that pulled me on uh, to uh, uh, end up with uh, uh, where we have now ended up. So that is, uh, that's basically all I have to do in terms of presenting uh, the, uh, the the, the basic constructive logic of the book. Uh, Arthur has a number of other things to say, I know, because uh, uh, he has read uh, uh, the, the book as a whole. So uh, I think it's perhaps time now uh, for us to turn to uh, to Roger, uh, to Arthur, not to Roger, obviously, to Arthur. Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> As well, as always, a uh, great lecture. Uh, now I pass uh, to uh, the floor to Artura, Professor Artura Araujo to make the comments. Please, Professor. Professor, professor Artura, I think it's Luisa who will pass. Yeah, I think it's yes, Lúcia. If Luisa is prepared, I'm ready. Just a minute, okay? Tá, agora que eu vi, não estou sem. Tá bom para vocês aí na tela? Sim, sim. Posso, tá. Tá bom. Começar? Posso começar? Estão me ouvindo bem? Posso começar? Eu estou te ouvindo muito bem. Pera okay. um minutinho só, Arthur, Isso. ela está ajustando a tela. Aí, só um segundo. Acho que só um minutinho. É. Pronto. Desculpa. Agora pode ir em frente. Posso? Nada bala. Acho que sim, sim, né? Pode. Pode. Então, uh, good afternoon. Before my commentary, I want to say that uh, I feel very honored to comment Professor Robert Ines' book. Uh, aesthetic is, uh, has not been my, in my field of research. It's uh, my fork here is doubled and I hope I can uh, be up to this task. In dimensions of aesthetic encounters, we find a collection of essays, articles and chapters that reflects Professor Robert Ennis' interest in his original approach to aesthetics. Open it collection, interestingly, Professor Enix explored Giordani's painting, The Sunset, in order to develop the relations implicit and explicit between John Dewey's and Charles Peirce for grounding of the category of, the, of quality and the qualitative matrix of perception. Regarding uh, Dewey's thought in particular, we must pay attention to Professor Enix's methodological moving linking art as experience and experience in nature. This idea points out to deal with naturalism as rethinking experience along naturalist lines as an interaction between the organism and its environment, as opposed to a discrete sensory unit, such as stimulus, impression, idea, or sensu datum. 
In several parts of his collection, in fact, Professor Innes puts Dewey's critic of atomistic thought in convergence with the notion of Gestalt in psychology. For him, Gestalt or form sets the constant interaction between organism and its environment. I will say more about the notion of form toward the end of my comments. In this sense, referring to Dewey, Professor Innes underlines that experience is formed as a part of natural processes to which the human being is fundamentally tied and aesthetic experience is the highest form of this interaction, which once again links art as experience and experience in nature. In addition to this way of understanding the connection of art experience in nature, Professor Innes recognizes that the conception of his collection is a kind of extended meditation and on an application of the insights of Merleau-Ponty on the pre-reflexive realm of painting, which is a matter, it's a matter of lived experience. That is to say, lived and embodied experience integrating organism and environment. In chapter three, quality and the theory of science, we find Professor Innes' core construction of the relations between Dewey and Persis or Dewey's Persian aesthetics in his own words. Dewey's art as experience, which makes no mention whatsoever of Peirce, is informed operatively by the unfold of the aesthetic implications of, in his 1935 essay, Peirce Theory of Quality, Dewey considered Peirce's most important contribution to philosophy to be his theory of quality. From this insight, I think, Professor Innes not only makes explicit Dewey's reading of Peirce, but in an original way, he deepens an understanding of aesthetic experience as a process in which there is an escape from conventional to perception. And in the case of art, art in the case of artworks, even verbal art is clearly a consequence of the artwork's unique multi-leveled semiotic structure. For Professor Innes, in addition, understanding aesthetic experience as the basic interaction between the living creature and its environment, Dewey regards nature as the originating matrix of this interaction in, a, in the form of a network of force, energy, and situations. What in experience in nature, the moving and balanced balance of thinking. Things. Very quickly, it's also interesting to consider Professor Innes, Link Dewey, and Samuel Alexander in the chapter four. In particular, he looks into Alexander, uh, he say, arti artistic creation and cosmic creation. Professor Innes notes that for Alexander, as a beauty in nature comes from an impulsion from nature itself, the use of impulsion echoes Dewey's own work in foregrounded the continuous dynamism, dynamism of the flux of experience. In art as experience, that uh, means Dewey, Dewey's fundamental picture of er, the organism environment nature relationship as a constant circuit or spiral of engagements that is participatory and reconstructive. Finally, I will allow myself to consider two notions that seems to me be, uh, that seems to me uh, closely intertwined in Professor Innes reading of Peirce and Dewey. On one hand, Peirce's understand of mind as topos, place or space. On the other hand, Dewey considered a form that is a character of every experience that is an experience. Topos and form are two central notions in the French mathematician René Tombs, uh, semiophysics. On page uh, 46, incidentally, Professor Innes refers to René Tom as he understands that the energetic object is a semiotic attractor and force field. In his topological theory of meaning, René Tom coins the neologism semiophysics. Semio in continuity with uh, the, author, the author's earlier theory of catastrophe, the idea of a semiophysics portrays a physics of meaning, which is an expression used by Jean Petitot. 
In Thom's semiophysics, understood as a topological theory of meaning, insofar as a living organism's ongoing di dynamics amount to an interacting field of vector situated in specific environments, we can conclude that meaning incorporates topological form in comparison with Dewey. Form is a character of every experience. There is an experience. Form be, may then be defined as the operation of forms that carry the experience of, of an agent, object, scene, and situation to its own integral fulfillment. For Hanetton, most importantly, the idea is that geometrical forms are common to all forms of life, including, for example, linguistic forms. I quote Hanetton, we are in the meaning since we feel it signifying. This is where the great interest of the geometrization of the meaning lies in. Finally, with due respect, I ask Professor Innes if he agrees that meaning is something felt as a topos or form in our aesthetic experience as presented, as presented in his dimensions of aesthetic encounters regarding Dewey's reading of Pierce. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Araújo, uh, for your comments. Uh, very special comments. Uh, I now uh, give the floor for Professor Inu. I think he wants to please. Professor. I, I think. Um... I thank uh, uh, Arthur for his uh, very, very clear and sharp reading of the of of my book, and uh, for his uh, ability to pull out the lines uh, that uh, that uh, I think may be uh, the most uh, problematic, but also the ones that confirm that uh, that I wasn't all the uh, clearly on on the uh, on the uh, on the wrong track. Um, uh, I'd like to start with something that was he said earlier about uh, uh, that my book is an extended meditation on the pre-reflective realm of of painting uh, from Merleau-Ponty, which is a matter of lived experience. It's it's true that there is a, a, a it, it's clear that there is a pre-reflective element, a element of immediacy uh, in 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 our understanding of of painting. But uh, it's a mediated immediacy, it seems to me, and and in all in all respects. And Merleau-Ponty's the deep reflections on 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 painting, uh, in spite of his insistence upon uh, pre-reflective experience, uh, uh, is generally uh, put within a kind of a large a larger uh, semiotic frame uh, that comes from the French tradition of Saussure and others, uh, and the notion of plays of the play of difference and the emergence of ordered forms uh, out of the uh, synthesis of, uh, of, of signifying elements below the, uh, the, the level of the uh, ultimate emergence of, of, of form. Uh, the, the, the second thing deals with, uh, I think this is very, very complicated and there's been a lot of discussions of, that I've had with uh, about what what really is how far can we really take the 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 the, the correlations between uh, Dewey and categories and and Persian categories that is Dewey and Dewey's notions and I think it's pretty clear that Dewey reconstructed he didn't reconstruct he just discovered on his own what is a, a pretty obvious uh, a, a thing dealing with the nature of consciousness namely that uh, uh, the, the affective qualitative structure of immediate consciousness the consciousness of of the other of alterity uh, which is the interruptive aspect of, of 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 our of our engagement with the world and then the demand for continuities so there was a passage in Artist's Experience where Dewey talks about we live in a world of qualities, stress and strain, and continuities. The, a world of qualities, the world of stress and strain, and the world of, of, of continuities is very clearly 
the firstness, secondness, and thirdness, uh, thirdness uh, schema. There's no escaping it. Uh, Dewey's recognized the reality of it, but did not want to name it uh, in terms of, uh, of modes. He wanted to, uh, he, he discussed that in terms of aspects, but it did not prevent him at all from analyzing uh, 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 aesthetic objects uh, in, those, in, those, in those terms. And uh, uh, it's also clear that the icon uh, uh, index uh, uh, symbol uh, uh, schema uh, has a, plays a real role in Dewey's analysis. And there's a part in, uh, in uh, a section in Art as Experience where he very clearly says to analyze a work of art, we have to realize it has uh, three dimensions. He says it has an imaginal dimension, uh, it has an, a, a diagrammatic dimension, and it has, uh, a, a, he doesn't use the word symbolic, but it has the, an effect, uh, the dimension of its, its, its meaning, if it's articulate meaning, it's intelligible intelligibility, the aesthetic idea. And it's pretty clear that those refer to, uh, to uh, Peirce's uh, uh, major triad of uh, semiotic, uh, a semiotic triad. So what, when, uh, when uh, Arthur says that Dewey's experience, artist makes no mention of Peirce, my passage there, uh, but uh, uh, out of that arises, I think, very clearly that Dewey did read Peirce closely, and he knew the theory of signs. And in 1945, he defended Peirce's theory of signs and his theory of linguistic meaning against, uh, uh, against an opponent. And he did it in a very sarcastic and almost brutal way, uh, in a most impolite and impolite way. The... Uh, the last question, though, that dealing with René Tom and Puitito and 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 the others, um, uh, could it be? If, uh, I can't. I, I I wish I could remember exactly what the uh, how the the question was was formulated. Arthur, could you just if, maybe you could just say it out loud uh, uh, about what the relationship is uh, to form? You say you agree. Ask me if I agree that meaning is sometimes something felt as topos or form. In our aesthetic experience, I think, of course, it it's it's it, it is experienced as form. You you yourself quoted one of those passages, a long passage that form arises when experience is carried to completion, and in a certain sense stabilized in a structure. Dewey does not make a lot of talk about the structures, but it's pretty obvious when Dewey talks about aesthetic experience not being fleeting, not being random. Uh, not being ad hoc or scattered. When he talks about aesthetic, uh, aesthetic experience fully, whereas an experience goes to completion, it, it's consume, it, it, it attains a, 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 a fulfillment. He calls this obviously a consummatory uh, experience. However, consummatory experiences are not unique to aesthetic experience uh, as, as in relation to art. It's also connected with a sense of of the completion of an insight, for example, or of the sense of bringing a course of inquiry to completion uh, uh, and of a sense of arriving at an answer that is right. I, I'm reminded of um, Schrodinger's, Irvin Schrodinger's comment once about uh, alternative formulations of quantum theory. And he was brutal. He was a brilliant mathematician, but he said, person X, Obviously, those equations, those equations, I understand them. He says, but that cannot be, that cannot be a proper formal schematization of the, the core mathematical relations. And then when he was asked why, he said, they're just so ugly, those equations. They have nothing, they, 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 they don't do the job. He says, quantum theory is this beautiful thing. We have now a beautiful part of the a world picture, and now we're going to capture it in these ugly equations. And uh, Schrodinger uh, used that as, the, as, the, as, the, as his criterion. And there's a large literature 
on uh, aesthetic, uh, the aesthetics of science. There's a large literature on the role of beauty and scientific theory formation and all of that. And Schrodinger is, is, is not alone with that. You find it also in the human sciences. Uh, they don't like, you don't like messy, messy explanations you or you do not like messy theories they have to be theories that have some elegance to them some beauty uh, and uh, that i think is uh, is um, uh, is connected with the question that you ask uh, the geometrization of meaning for tom uh, it, 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 it is a dynamic notion tom thinks of course of, of meaning arising in these processes and in his uh, paper on from the icon to the symbol, I have that, I, I reprinted that in my semiotics anthology um, uh, from, in the, from 1985. I, it was, I thought it was one of the really key, key texts that bore upon, uh, bore upon the, uh, the um, uh, not just semiotics, but uh, the, the semiotics of art itself and uh, the genesis of forth, the, the universe as a, as, as a play of forms. And uh, so, yes, I think that we, uh, the forms are arrived at, but in a certain sense, the use of the word topos as place, uh, uh, a topos in Greek obviously means, means, means place. So um, uh, aesthetic forms are places of, 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 of meaning, but they, are, uh, uh, they should be defined as points of arrival. Uh, and as the outcome of processes and not of antecedent structures that are imposed upon uh, upon a, a foreseen result. I don't know whether that answers or is partial as, as, as somewhat of an answer to to your to your questions. Um, Thank you, Professor Yuri. Uh, uh, Lucy, I, I think I have some problems of connection because uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I couldn't hear, hear uh, Bob. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I could answer. I could give your answers, but uh, I don't know whether that would be that would be exactly kosher. Uh, I had an experience when I was teaching in Denmark where. Uh, the, 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 we had planned something for a following day where um, a, a young woman who was a, a young younger professor was going to give a talk that was a, a commentary on my paper. And uh, she had been asked a question. She had been asked a question and insulted by another person. So she did not show up the next day. She got on the train and went home. So wow. the question was, what were you going to do? <laughs> I played both parts. I presented her paper and I presented her my response to it by walking back and forth and, uh, from one end of the text <laughs> to the other. <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, I don't know whether that, I mean, people stared and say, what are you going to do? But, you know, at the end, it's like, hey, that works. And I, 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 would, I would point to her and say, I think you would say something very different from what I've been saying here. And I think the reason would be this. And I say, what do you think of that? And I say, well, I'm not too sure you're right from such and such. <laughs> and, uh, but I, we don't have to do that. We do not have to do that on this, uh, on, on this, on, on this occasion. Um, but I think you have my book right, and I think you see the connections, and I think you see very clearly uh, how it would you could expand it in a different direction by something that's only mentioned, but how that could be taken further. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is uh, I think that is uh, that is correct. And I have had read, uh, letters from other people saying I think we could go somewhere this type of doing this type of thing, more formalized, more formalization of the of the uh, of the schemas, more formalization of the aesthetic dimensions, and uh, that is I mean that's that that's something that one would have to see whether how far one could. What one could take it, uh, but the point of uh, the point of the book and the following these these trails was to do more than one thing, and that's what makes it so difficult to really talk about. There's a there's an analytical trail, there's an exemplification trail, uh, there's a historical trail, right, and there's a comparative philosophy trail, and all of those things are 
are, are being done in a different way. And we're following the line of Peirce and the line of Dewey, the line of Langer and others. So uh, it, it, the attempt to find out how they bear upon other things, so there's not just expository, because the book is not exposition of positions, it's discussion of topics and themes with these analytical tools. So in a very real sense, the book has a lot of heroes, uh, uh, from Peirce and Langer and Dewey, and, and uh, Jean Kalevich's wonderful book on the ineffable, on, on, on music and the ineffable, uh, and uh, Benami Sharfstein's great book on, on, on comparative aesthetics, on, on, on art having no borders, and there is no theory that covers everything, and all of these other things, all of those are, are playing out on this sort of multi-level tapestry of or analytical threads. That's why I, I wanted to call my uh, talk a, uh, uh, a trail of linkages. In fact, is that perhaps should have been the, uh, the subtitle of the book, uh, probably would have been a better subtitle, but uh, Les Jeux Sont Faits, but the, mm -hmm. <laughs> everything has been, done, every, it was all done, and so that, that, was, uh, that was it. Um, Thank you, Professor. I I think that uh, you summarized very nicely uh, the all of the trails we can uh, run in your book and the richness of uh, what you expose with all the authors and uh, uh, it always uh, I think your book is a very Reach deep that we can uh, have uh, in the field of aesthetics and semiotics, especially with the dialogues that you uh, show us how how to do uh, with all the the authors and the richness of their um, theories and all of it is. Uh, I must. Uh, recall that we have already read some of your papers and articles in our uh, set, uh, the research group of uh, Center of Pragmatism, mm -hmm. and uh, it's always a test that uh, reach uh, very important points of the attack key attack theories in the contemporary art and ancient arts and uh, it's always a gift so thank you very much for your lectures and your uh, inspired articles always and uh, and uh, now i i we we have maybe more five minutes i don't know if professor Ibi wants to Say uh, I, I think that it, it will be nice to open for some questions okay. on this session, uh, at least. Would you, is there someone that would like to make a question or comment, please? Uh, again, uh, Andre Detienne, please. Um, well, I, yeah, I listen very carefully to, to this presentation, and uh, I am very glad we have heard everything they said, Bob, and I am glad that we are much beyond a Hegelian way of representing aesthetics. <laughs> um, um, you, you mentioned Schrodinger talking about ugly equations, and then I thought, um, whenever Peirce talked about equations, when one, one of the terms used, especially in logic, but also in mathematics, they are icons. <laughs> and and, and uh, that which seems not to be representable in traditional ways, uh, or even simply to assemblies of symbols, do manifest patterns, do manifest forms, and those forms uh, are essentially um, imageable. And by imageable, it does not necessarily mean something you can paint or draw. Uh, um, they are more fundamentally iconizable. Uh, I would imagine that if Peirce says, you know, whatever is real is cognizable, and, and the semiotizable, that it, when it comes to forms, they have to be, as far as being real, they have to be iconizable in one way or, or another. 
that it reminds me that early on, even already in 1868, um, Peirce makes this startling observation. Um, there are no images. We have no images. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, but then you you go into the detail, and what he means is uh, we do not have image. If by image, one conceives them as very naively as a total of a singular representation. Mm. And and and, uh, uh, and you might think, well, you know, I'm taking a photograph of something, and it is a point by point uh, reflection of the light, and it, it is exact two dimensionally, and everything that is to be, to be seen is there, and there is nothing else, and that is a way of reducing an image or even a painting to something that it is what it is within its compass, with, within its frame, and everything in it is singular. Uh, and uh, one has then to go into it and simply account for whatever it is that feels that, sing that singularity or, or set of singularities. First says that is absolutely not how it works. We never form an image in that way in our mind. We cannot sustain such an image in our mind. We cannot have a memory of it because everything goes away. That is not how what images do. Images are always general. In, in as far as the presentation uh, uh, of final manifestations, that uh, he see them not as actual experiences, even when you are contemplating a photograph in front of you, it's not an actual experience or it's not reducible to its actuality. It is a vast potential of experiences that, that vary <laughs> even as you look at them, because you can only grasp one portion of it at a time and uh, you are subject to all of those forms that are all at work there may be a generalized form of the, of the whole but there are plenty of forms underneath which bring me to my question you talked about forms as point of arrival um but once you but but what kind of points are there <laughs> and 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 then uh are they not also points of departure Would you like to comment? Thank you, Professor Becceni. Always. Professor, Ines would like to say something or someone else? I have a small comment. Just okay. A, just a small comment. It's. I think I even quoted in the book, but I know I quoted it. It's very clear in, in my book that I wrote on Langer. Langer once said that it's that life involved life is it is the ordering of felt life that is we are we are feeling beings and feeling is meant to com comprehend all the different modes in which we are touched by the world wherever so thinking and mathematical operations and all those are, are also ways of uh, they have their own tone their own feeling tone but she says one place she says every time we in we engage experience, she says, we impose some image on it. And then she makes the contrast, she says, or the continuation. She says, whether it's gestic or kinesthetic, that is whether it's a gesture or whether it's kinesthetic, it's a mode of feeling, a mode of movement, in addition to the identification of it, whether it is a, we hear a sound and we oppose uh, a schema on it. And she uses image in a certain way, very close to the notion of a schema. They're, they, they, but they're somewhere between the abstract and the, con and the, and the concrete. And uh, I wonder whether what Andre would say, uh, you know, to this about uh, 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 of whether the, the, the very notion of an image uh, and Persis sense does not demand definiteness, right? But it, right. it but it it leads to definiteness. That is the image, the role of the image is to make definite, but the image itself is not necessarily itself definite. Uh, that is a part of the difficulty. If it is not in, <laughs> definite, well, it is indefinite. Which means it is a realm of indetermination, but with a certain form. It's not just anything that can come out of it, but it's 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 it is it, 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 it's also that you cannot 
bring it or expand it into something fully definite in the sense that it would be one and only one range of interpretation of it. Uh, you, you can show me, see, a photograph uh, dear to you of a person, uh, of your wife, and then say, this is my wife. And, and that would be reductive. <laughs> it is a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, professors. And uh, I would, um, I don't know, ah, Professor Ibn, please, please. It, it's only uh, an observation. Uh, I'm, I would like to say that I'm reading, I'm reading uh, uh, in Bob, Bob's book, uh, but I, I, I haven't, I'm still reading, I haven't yet. Finish it, <laughs> but it's my plan to read it until in the next month or, or so I will finish. But at this point, I would like to say that it's an outstanding book. It's a very, very important book for this for the research in, in aesthetics. And uh, I'd like to say that we have a uh, also, we have a, a group of researching in statics. Uh, it's commanded by Lucia and Zanetti. And uh, it, 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 it would be a, a good idea to, to take this book as a, an access for studying statics in the next year, you know, in the first semester. Perfect. So it's my my recommendation, okay? And maybe we can count on Bob to uh, lecture in our group, even uh, online. Or if he can came, he can come. Okay, it's a very welcome, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> but you know, COVID is returning. It's a, it's Sounds terrible. good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. No, it's a, another, another, another uh, sub variation of COVID now. It's a terrible. Uh, I think that uh, the Greek alphabet will be exhausted. You know, there is no, no more letters to, <laughs> to give name to the variations. Okay, so thank you, Bob, and I wish you big success, which I'm certain that. We will go. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, Arthur, as well. Excellent thank you. commentary. And, and I want to th I want to thank you for the invitation. And uh, uh, it's it's rare to be given to be given the task of giving an opening an opening lecture and giving a closing lecture in the same meeting in the same meeting. And uh, I have to say that uh, the first lecture for me was much easier than the attempt to try to uh, uh, to uh, put my book into uh, a form that would only last 35, 40, 40 minutes. But I, I, I did the best I could because many people I think who are listening have not seen it. So uh, there had to be some way of presenting and discussing at the same time for a presentation of what it's about and then also some illustrations. So, uh, but I thank you for the opportunity and, uh, and for the collegiality that we've always experienced with these meetings. I, we love them because of the lack of, of aggression uh, and of competition. People are together and they're talking about things that mean something to them and they discuss them in, in civil manners. And uh, that is just, a, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful format uh, of intellectual friendship and, and, and comity. Uh, and uh, we want to thank, I want to thank all of you for the, the 10 years or more that I've been coming down physically. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it has always been these, this, you leave feeling as if you've been enriched. And, uh, uh, and it's because uh, everybody works together and, and, uh, the, uh, and have dedicated a lot of their time, sacrificed their time to make it smooth for all the rest of us. And uh, that is a form of generosity that, uh, comes from, as I wrote, from Paul Ceylon, paying attention. <laughs> that's, that's what has really happened. And we all benefit from 
the modes in which everybody organizing this has paid attention and the ones who have all participated in presenting. So I, 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 I'm deeply, deeply thankful. So thank you very much once again. And uh, applause to everybody who has been engaged in, 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 this, in this meeting. Okay, we will applaud. We will applaud in a few minutes. The, the three. <laughs> <laughs> That's my time to have a say. Say yeah, it. Yeah. Say it now or don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank. Thank you. Thank That's you. finished. Uh, yeah, I will call now Professor Ivo Ivi, the conference chair of the twenty first. International Meeting on Pragmatism and Director of the Center of Pragmatism Studies to um, uh, chair the, this closing ceremony. Okay, are you seeing the, the screen? Yes, yes. I can okay. see. May I continue? Okay. Yes, please. I, I, I think everyone. Is so this is a, the closing ceremony. And uh, I'm trying to enter. manage. Põe um enter. O enter, eu acho que vai. Não? Não está indo, não. Clica no enter no, no seu teclado. No page, page down. Page down. Page down. Ou aqui na, na, no, com o mouse, se você for nessa, nessa flechinha à direita, lá embaixo. Aqui. Isso aí. Vê se vai. Ah, sim. Pronto. Essa tá boa. So, Ivo Ibri, that's me. So... We're coming to the closing of the 21st International Meeting on Pragmatism, which marks 24 years of con con continuous work of our Center for Pragmatism Studies. I wish to thank primarily our sponsors, FAPESP and CNPQ, and moreover, the precious support we received from Campanella Sociedade de Advogados, Tartanha Vasconcelo Jr., Ideia Viva, Escola de Cultura, José Luiz Zanetti, Júlio de Oliveira e nossa queridíssima Vera Maria Zugai. I especially believe that all, all of us must thank the efficiency of our organizational team whose assistance make this event possible, from its planning until its execution which today we conclude. At this moment, I will mention each one by name. Firstly, ask, I ask the audience to applaud with me the leaders of this team, the professors, Luisa Gizzi and Lucia Dantas. Okay, a big applaud. <laughs> Thank you to all. These are the names. Arturo Araújo, Cassiano Terra Rodrigues, Eloísa Guizzi, José Luiz Anetti, Lúcia Tantas, Maria Alessandra Madi, Renan Baggio. For the working for the projects and reports, Júlio César de Oliveira, Lucas Antônio Saran. Working for <coughs> communication social insertion, Adriana Teixeira. Working for proofreading and translation of texts, Kaique Marra de Mello, D'Artagnan Vasconcelos, Jr., Henry Mallet, Lucas Antonio Saran, Ryan Oak. Working for support during the week in the event, Adriana Teixeira, Barbara Beatriz Silvestre Sampaio, Kaique Marra Mello, Gabriela Lima Mascarenhas Moreira, Lucas Antonio Saran, Renan Henrique Baggio, e Ryan Oak. The amazing design of the 21st uh, IMP Visual Identity by Raquel Ponte. You can see this piece of art in the screen. The website 
by Lúcia de Souza Dantas and Luisa Gizzi, another work of art in the screen. The Social Media and YouTube by Lúcia de Souza Dantas. Thank you so much, Lúcia. Uh, <clears throat> the links are in Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. The opening concert by the, the amazing soprano Lucia Fischer, the pianist Ana Paula Ferreira, accordionist Renan Nonato, and the violinist Edson Verbisk. Our special thanks to conferences, conference and roundtable lecturers, lecturers commentators, lecture session chairs, roundtable chairs and proponents, communication sessions, shares. In our opening conference, I wish you to all a week of good studies, learning and fertile exchange of ideas. At the end of this journey, I hope this objective have, have been accomplished. May this academic event continue to fructify and grow and may May you all be with us once more in our future meeting that we intend to realize in 2023, now as presential one. We believe that this 21st meeting transpired reasonably with what had been planned and we are so glad and satisfied because of this. We were able to maintain our tradition of cordial and cooperative debate with respect towards the work and research of each one. With our warmest Brazilian embrace to all of you on behalf of, of the team that hardly have worked during this week, I would like to say thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next Sim. November. <laughs> Agora, se, se todos puderem abrir a câmera, nós podemos tirar uma foto. Isso. Vamos fazer um print screen. Mesmo quem tiver de pijama e descabelado, não tem problema. <laughs> even, yeah. even those that, that are wearing pijamas and... Uh, with the uh, with, 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 with the with the messy hair, no no problem. Estou aqui a Renata diretamente diretamente de de Portugal, a nossa querida Verinha, querida, que bom ver você. Olá, Mito Cecília. Tiago, será que cabe todo mundo numa tela só? Sim, para mim está aparecendo uma tela só. Tá, o roco. Então, tirou aí, Eloísa. Eu, eu já, que... fiz, já fiz algumas, mas agora vamos fazer uma oficial. Cadê o Todo Rogério? Mundo... Rogério, é. apareça. Renan. <risos> all of you Júlio can César. open the screen for us to take a print screen. <risos> print screen. Depois você põe no nosso site, né? Tá certo? Pode, pode, pode é. expor, claro. Oh, o César apareceu, o Júlio, é. o Júlio. Renan, Rogério e Roco, se você pode abrir a screen para nós tomar uma tela de print, screen. I don't know. mas talvez eles não estejam, melhor já fazer. É. Tá bom, faça agora e... Então Pronto. vamos lá. Um, dois... Ah, Aí. ok. Ah, agora veio. Espera um pouquinho, então. Mais uma. Mais uma. Sorry, I, I was cooking okay. you because here is 9, 9, 9 p.m. So. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> Bob, 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 you, you, you are, Bob, you are too far in this, the, in your, yes. Closer, yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you for everything. Thank you, one. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Obrigada. Uh, to all of you. Thank you very much.